couple times it's you I see. I put you first, that's all I need. I humble all I am, all to you. One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. Hope some of you out there are actually doing your one ways out there. Watch this. You are always, always there. Every how and everywhere. You grace above so deeply within me. You will never, ever change. Yesterday, today, the same. Forever, forever, be snowman. Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. One way, Jesus, you're the only one that I could live for. This morning, it comes from Matthew, uh, first chapter, verses 20 to 23. When he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in the dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which she is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. All right, good morning, everyone. I'm very glad that you could be here with us today. Uh, today, I like you in your re readings to consider the people that you've been contacting this week. I hope you've been calling someone or texting them or messaging them now to let you know that we're all in, or we're all thinking about them. Uh, as we go up into our, our services this morning, I want you to consider all of your friends are with here with you today and hope that you enjoy this service. Don't forget to keep making those connections during the week now. And as we go into our service, Doug, do you have some announcements for us today? I do.
I want to welcome you also uh, to worship with us this morning. Glad you're tuning in. Um, I actually brought something to commemorate what we're doing. There are some people that are very kindly making all over the basin these masks so everybody can wear them at the hospitals and the retirement homes. And this one was gifted to me by Anna. So anyway, I'm not going to wear this the whole time because we're six feet apart and we're under 10. So we're doing this meeting all on the up and up. This morning we're here to remember Jesus, to celebrate Jesus, and to celebrate the fact that God loves us so much that he sent Jesus and Jesus willingly gave himself to die for us. And so I'm gonna start our service with uh, a prayer and then let's see, I think we go back to worship. Does that sound good? Yeah. Okay, let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for giving us your son. Thank you for giving us eternal life. Thank you for giving us forgiveness of our sins. And thank you for leading us to yourself, for drawing us, for opening our eyes that we could see our need, and for bringing the gospel to us. And I pray this morning that whether we're in this room physically or in this room digitally, that today we would be seeking you and your heart for us, your desire for us. And I have to pray that Kino Christian Church, even during this dispersed time, would be doing your work, would be sharing the gospel, would be encouraging one another, speaking the truth in love to one another. And Father, I pray specifically for those that are living alone and in a sense stuck alone that they don't have visitors can't come see them and i pray god that you would comfort them and encourage them and for those that are out of work i pray father that you would provide and father those that are still working i pray that you would give them the strength because they're having to work hard in various roles and grocery stores and health care facilities and and transportation and whatever and father i just pray that you would help us as a culture particularly us as christians that we would live lives that are safely blessing each other and particularly for the church father i pray that your church would be a shining light in the darkness that surrounds us in jesus name amen Our next song is Our God Reigns. Uh, when Jesus was in heaven and he came down here on earth, he gave up his majesty as King of Kings and Lord of Lords to be uh, our sacrificial offering uh, for all mankind to die for us as an atonement for all our sins. Now he lives again his majesty is all continuing. He swings as king of kings and lord of lords. Now, we're going to sing our God reigns.
feet from torn from the burden of sin, there is power in the blood, and there's power in the blood. Help us sing that, please. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you believe all the victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood, come for a cleansing to Calvary's time. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you deserve this for Jesus your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you the daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. So this communion is also Palm Sunday. I remember the Palm Sundays that I grew up with because I was in California and saw all the kids would be given their palms and we'd run down the aisle waving our palms. It's a beautiful, beautiful. It's not always easy in areas that are less arid. So the very Christians did not have Christmas to celebrate. And there was no indication they ever celebrated Easter either. They had the Lord's Supper. This memorial of bread and wine was a centerpiece for the lives of the early Christians. And here at Kino Christian, it is our weekly part of worship today. This is Passion Week. Very, very powerful week. Jesus' glorious entry into Jerusalem. The Passover meal becomes the Lord's Supper. And Jesus is betrayed and sent to die on the cross. He is put in a tomb and guarded, and on the third day he is resurrected, alive again, overcoming death. Jesus kept telling this to his disciples that this was coming, but they could never really wrap their heads around it until he revealed himself. So the final 12 disciples gathered in the upper room to take Passover meal, a holy Jewish ceremony, remembering that God protected his people and led them out of slavery in Egypt. With the blessing Jesus made over bread and wine, it becomes the Lord's Supper. Back in Capernaum, after his miracle of the fish and loaves and walking out on the sea, Jesus talked about what will become the Lord's Supper. On John 6, 53 through 55, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Now raise him up on the last day, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. And um, this was very shocking to everybody because those who did not understand that it was about following Jesus in his words, um, it sounded more like cannibalism, which kind of weeded out those who understood Jesus and those who just 
wanted a glorious king. So then Jesus explained in the upper room that his bread was his body, broken for you, and his wine was his blood, spilled for you. Communion is very important. It also says in the Bible, I'm not quite sure where, where, but it talks about how we have to make sure that we're ready to take it and that we're truly ready to remember Jesus and be part of his family. We may say a prayer for our communion. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for keeping us all safe through this virus. Thank you for bringing us your son, Jesus Christ, and his salvation. A man and God who was without sin to be sacrificed so that we could see and be glorious in front of our God at the end. Amen. Thank you. So, um, I just want to let you know that there are all kinds of gifts from our parishioners, lots of service in this little church. Uh, of course, there's also the financial prayer, one of the strongest things we can do, um, studying his word. So many things you can do. Lord, thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Um, Pastor Doug wanted me to let you know that in March, we took in more than usual. We did for the month of March. Very great um, giving. And so, uh, and considering half of those services were kind of our learning how to use this uh, technology. So thank you, thank you all who are mailing in your checks and offerings. And um, we are grateful and for all the gifts. Dear Lord, bless this church and its family as it's extended. It's a strange time with this virus, but you're mightier than any virus out there. And um, 
thank you for being our law. And in your son's name, Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, Sherilyn, and thank you, Jean. It is an adventure doing this service this way. We add in a, a, a massive um, amount of technology to do this. Not only the camera filming, but Facebook having to work. And then as we try to watch and on other devices, they, it doesn't come through. So I hope you're watching and you're, it's coming through to you. We have been going through, since last Sunday, a series called The Arduous Journey to the Cross. And as I showed, shared with you before, the word arduous means uh, hard, difficult, painful, uh, frustrating, confusing, um, and of course tempting, tempting in the sense of tempting to quit. And Jesus, we learned last week, from before the foundation of the world began his journey to the cross, all the while feeling the temptations you and I feel uh, to quit when stuff gets hard, when stuff gets frustrating, when stuff gets confusing. And he didn't quit. And so um, our series is we're going to look at before creation. We looked at that last week. And then today is coming to earth and setting his sights. And when we looked last time at Before Creation, we looked at passages that showed that there was a book of life that existed before creation. And that Jesus was writing down names of people that God chose before the foundation of the world. Knowing full well that the only reason those names could be written would be that Jesus would have to die for them. And so Jesus' commitment to die for you and I began before the foundation of the world. And then today, we're going to look at it, uh, his coming to earth. And then next Friday night, not next Sunday, next Friday night, Good Friday, we will look at setting his sights where Jesus is approaching the cross. And even though tempted by Peter and others to back away from that commitment, he said, no, I must go to Jerusalem and I must die. And that's what we'll be considering on Friday night. And then, of course, next Sunday, we will be considering the resurrection from the dead that Jesus brought to us. And so, um, let's see. Today, we're going to talk about that. Um, Jessica, are the notes online yet? They are going on as we speak. All right. Well, when the notes show up, what we're going to do is we're going to be walking through a passage in Philippians. So, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Philippians chapter 2. This is probably the turn to passage if you want to talk about the incarnation of Jesus. Jesus becoming human uh, even though he was God. And the reason it's a go-to passage is because this passage makes no bones about Jesus being God and becoming uh, human. So my Bible is not coming to that page very quickly. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Maybe it helps if I say them out loud. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2, and I'm going to start reading chapter 2, verse 1, and we'll read all the way through verse 11. Paul writes this. So if there is a, any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, 
but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which, was, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for giving us scripture. Thank you for the, your Holy Spirit inspiring Paul to write this passage so long ago. And for holding this passage and the rest of scripture together so that here we are 2,000 years after Jesus came and we can read what your Holy Spirit told Paul to write. And so as we walk through this passage, God, help us understand what Paul meant, what the Holy Spirit meant for us to get when he wrote it down. We ask these things that we might bring to Jesus glory. Amen. Amen. All right, so you'll notice if you've got the notes now, that I'm not going to go through the passage in the order it's written. We're actually going to start with verse 6, and we're going to look at 1 through 5 at the end. So, if you look at verse 6, verses 6 through 8 say this. Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So here, in a nutshell, is the passage that explains to us that Jesus, being God, having always been God, having always been with God, suddenly divested himself at some level of his situation. We don't know exactly how he did it, but the phrase is, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself and took on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And so every Christmas we rehearse the story of the baby in the manger, and the angels coming and telling these various people that the baby's going to be in the manger. And that the baby has come and that the baby's going to be Emmanuel, God with us. And this is what this passage is telling us about. But it's telling us about it from the perspective of heaven. It's as though we get to sit in a chair and watch as Jesus gets up from his throne at the right hand of the Father. And he gets up and he, in a sense, divests himself of whatever it is that he had to divest himself of, as it were, taking off his kingly robe, and then he steps down into a baby in Mary's womb. And what's really interesting is that we get to hear what Jesus is thinking as he does this. Remember that the study of man's thinking is called psychology. And so we get to have a psychological look at Jesus from this passage. Again, verse 6. Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. And so he gives us the first clue about what Jesus is thinking. He's sitting at the right hand of God. And he looks at himself. And he sees that he is God. And he looks and he says, I don't need to hang on to this. I don't need to keep this. I can divest myself of it and go become human. 
And again, we don't know exactly what he divested himself of. Obviously, Jesus, being God, was omnipresent. That means he was everywhere at once. Well, if you're everywhere at once and you're in, your, in a mama's womb, mama's going to hurt. He divested himself of that facet of his godness. Did he divest himself of his omniscience, that is, his knowing everything? We don't know. If you read the Gospels, the Gospels tell us Jesus knew a lot of stuff. He knew what was in people. He knew what was going to happen to him in the future. He knew the demons and how that had to play out whenever he cast out demons. So he knew more than the average human being, you and I. But there was also one time where he shared that he didn't know some things. Now, as you scratch your head, you got to remember, when did Jesus not know some things? Jesus said that the time of his return was only known by the Father. That he did not know it. So there's one thing we know Jesus didn't know. But did he get rid of the rest of his omniscience? We don't know. Okay? So, the first thing is he looked at himself and did not count this equality with God as something to be held onto and tightly grasped. Instead, he recognized he could let it go. The next thing says he emptied himself. He emptied himself. And the Greek word, word there is kind of interesting. It means emptied. <laughs> okay. He emptied himself. And what does that mean? You and I know what it's like to drink the last thing out of a pop bottle or, or a water jug, right? We emptied it. Well, how did Jesus empty himself? Remember, it said in the previous passage that he did not see his form of godness to be something to be held on to. So somehow he let go of his form of godness. And then it says this. He took on the form of a servant. Now realize that one form of godness that Jesus held is he's Lord over all. He's the highest Lord you can have, right? And he became a servant, so we have another clue. He was willing to let go of his being large and in charge. He was letting go of that position of authority that he held as God. And he became a servant. And then it gives us one more clue, being born in the likeness of man. So not only did he become a servant like the angels were servants in heaven, but he went one step lower and he became a human being. And then he went several steps lower, becoming a baby human being, a helpless human being. Where he had no ability to see to his own care. He depended completely on the care of his mom and dad. And so this is what Jesus is doing. And it's all based on what it said in, in verse 6. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, a thing to be held tightly to, a thing to not let go of. And because he was willing to let go of that, he could enter into the human race. And then it goes on. It says, and being found in human form, there are those through the history of the church that have tried to answer the question, how could God become man by saying, well, he really didn't become man. He became a sort of a man. But this passage tells us that he was born in A, the likeness of men, and B, found in human form. It's not giving us the option if he was kind of a man. Jesus was fully human. And then it gets, adds this. He humbled himself. He humbled himself. And again, let's take our psychology glasses and look at Jesus. What is he thinking? He's thinking, I am not so important, I need to get my way. I am not so important that I have to be pleased. I am not so important 
that I have to win. Jesus humbled himself. And again, couple that with do not count his godness as something to be grasped and held on to, including the very authority of godness. Because he became a servant, not a lord. It said he humbled himself by becoming obedient. And you all know how that works. In many ways, you, as you've become Christians, have begun to submit yourself to God in whole new ways. But you also know the struggle, because there are ways we all struggle with submitting ourselves to God in some ways. Maybe we're called to forgive somebody who hurt us badly. Maybe we're called to love someone and take care of them when we feel like not loving them because they bother us. Maybe we are called to become more faithful in, in studying his word and we just don't want to be bothered because we have other things to do. Or it's too hard or it makes us feel not so good for some reason. And so Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to God as a human being on earth. And that means Jesus faced all the same temptations that you and I feel without obedience. Jesus felt too tired to pray. Jesus felt, this person is a risk to me. I don't want to love them. Jesus felt, these people are going to fail me. Therefore, I don't want to minister to them. He felt all the things we feel. But it says in the book of Hebrews that he felt those temptations to be disobedient. Yet he did so without sin. So Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient. And then he adds this, obedient to the point of death. Now, you and I struggle with obedience for far less. <laughs> I don't know that any of us have been promised death if we obey Christ. But Jesus was promised death if he obeyed his father. And he said, I'm going to obey, even if it means dying. So he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. I don't know if you've ever felt that something that came your way that was bad, disappointing, was unfair. It's not fair that I'm getting treated like this. It's, it's a rip-off. You know, I don't deserve this. Well, Jesus, who is God Almighty in human flesh, who has never, ever sinned, is about to be nailed to the cross, which is the most awful punishment Rome had to offer at the time. And they only did it to the worst of criminals. But Jesus wasn't the worst of criminals, was he? And yet, it says he went to the cross as a lamb goes to the slaughter without uttering a complaint. Now, I don't know about you, but I know how to complain. I know how to whine when I don't have what I want. I know how to whine when life is not treating me the way I think it should. Jesus didn't complain. He was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So this is the main thing I want us to catch today. Jesus, being in nature God, with God, fully God, looked at himself and said, I don't need to hang on to this. For the benefit of others, I'm going to divest myself of this position and this authority. And I'm going to minister to people in not only a way that feels good to me, but I'm going to minister to them in a way that's going to hurt a whole bunch. And this is Jesus willing to divest himself of the pleasures, prerogatives, and authorities of being God to take on the servant and then humbling himself even to the point of death. That's our Jesus. That's our Savior. That's the one who went before us and saved us. The passage goes on. Paul wants us to hear what happened as a result. And we could wait till Easter to read this part, but I don't want to because this humbling, this 
not grasping that Jesus did, this obedience to the Father earned Jesus to follow him. Paul goes on in verse 9. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So God watched as Jesus was mistreated all the way to the cross. And then Jesus on the cross gave up his life. In fact, he said, no one takes my life. I lay down of my own accord. Jesus laid down his life on the cross. And then God raised him from the dead. And we get a fast forward past all the appearances on earth. You know, the coming out of the grave and the appearances to the disciples and all that. We fast forward to after that. It says, God highly exalts Jesus and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus' obedient humility, his obedient divesting, his obedient, his obedient service as a servant to go through that human life, that human death. God rewarded him by A, raising from the, him from the dead, and B, exalting him to the highest place. On Easter, we're going to look at a passage in Ephesians that describes that exaltation in even more detail. And so, here's a question. Why did Paul want the Philippian believers to know this micro view of Jesus, his thinking, and how God rewarded him? This is why I wanted to read it out of order, or cover it out of order. Because the way it is in Scripture, we read the why Paul wrote it before we read it. And because of that, we might miss the why, because we're too busy getting to the what Jesus did, what Jesus saw, what God did. And so now we go back to verse 1 in the notes. It's at the bottom, but you can look at your Bibles too. Paul writes, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Paul here is writing to Christians. And he's informing them, them of something. That when you are a Christian, you have access to, it is yours, the mind of Christ. <clears throat> that means that when I claim mental illness as a Christian, I'm only claiming mental illness as a person in my flesh. I've got the Holy Spirit living in me, which possesses the mind of Christ. And so here I am, I get to choose mentally ill, mind of Christ. Mentally ill, mind of Christ. <laughs> and Paul makes a recommendation. He says, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. Is he telling us to stay with our mentally ill? No, he's not. <laughs> He's telling us to put our focus on the mind given to us in Christ Jesus. He says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Hmm, my notes are not quite right. Let me read it out of the scripture. <clears throat> Yeah, my notes just add, it says 1 through 5, but it's only giving you 5, and instead of repeating what was above. And so, what I want us to focus on here is that we're to have this mind among ourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, and then it moves into the passage we've already covered. What was the mind of Jesus? To divest himself of all the privilege and prestige and comfort of, and authority of being God. To enter into the lowly state of humanity. And to enter it not as the king, not as the mighty warrior, but as the servant. 
who's willing to be used, abused, and killed. Please catch that. Paul is telling Christians in Philippi, Christians, you need to have this same mind that Jesus did. Divesting yourself of all the authority you have to run your own life. <laughs> Divesting yourself of all the authority you have to make sure your life pleases you. Divest yourself of that and take on the role of a servant, being obedient to the Father. That's what Jesus did. And Paul invites the Philippians, indeed he doesn't invite them, he commands them to have the same mind as Jesus. So this morning, I want us to just think on that. Think on the fact that the psychology of Jesus was to not grasp and hold that which was his and pleasing to him, but to let it go. And to serve others in a way that took on risk and displeasure, pain, frustration, betrayal, and even death. Today, around the world, there are Christian missionaries who are facing exactly similar circumstances. They're doing ministry in communist nations. They're doing ministry in Islamic nations. They're doing ministry in Hindu nations. And in those nations, it is entirely free for people who don't like them to throw them in jail or kill them. And yet they are doing what Jesus did. Many of them were born in England or born in America, and they had every privilege and every right to live comfortable lives. And they instead chose to divest themselves of that comfort and to go live that risky life to bring Jesus to those nations. What are the ways that we can take on this mind of Jesus? What are the ways we can let go of our prerogative to make sure our life is pleasing to us and instead make our lives pleasing to God and take on the risks of full obedience. What are the ways we can do that? There are a multitude of ways that each of us can consider. And so this morning, as we pray, I would like you here in the room and you out there on the internet, will you consider as we pray what it means for you personally to take on the mind of Christ as illustrated in this passage? Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, it is so easy for us to please ourselves because we're in a front row seat. <laughs> we get to drive the truck. We know exactly what we want to please ourselves with. We know what brings us pleasure. We know what brings us pain. Because of that front row seat, we drive the truck in ways that please us, that bring us pleasure and comfort and ease. And I pray, Father, that you would help us in that front row seat begin to take on the mind of Christ as we drive our lives. Father, help us humble ourselves to you and live our lives the way you instruct. Even when it causes us pain and frustration and confusion. And here in America, it probably won't cause us death, but it may cause some other kind of hurt. And I pray that you would give us the courage be willing to humble ourselves even in that case. Thank you, Jesus, for having this mindset. And because you have this mindset, we get saved. And I pray, Father, that you would help us know Jesus and know this mindset thoroughly so we can do it. We ask these things that we might bring you glory, Father, the way Jesus brought you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
today. Our next song, and our last song, is Crown Me With Many Crowns. And in this one, I like the part where it says, Crown Him, Lord of Life, who triumphed over the grave, and rose victorious in the strife for those who keep to save. So let's sing, Crown Him With Many Crowns. Thank you. Thank you. 